Good afternoon from Beijing. Thanks for joining today's webinar. I'd like to welcome you to our discussion of challenges and opportunities of world migration, and most importantly, the official launch of the 2020 World Migration Report, the Chinese edition. My name is Martin Geiger, and I'm honored to chair and moderate this meeting. This event is co-hosted and organized by the Center for China and Globalization and the International Organization for Migration. I'd like to thank already right at the beginning everyone at CCG and IOM who helped organizing this event. CCG, the Center for China and Globalization, is a leading non-governmental think tank based in Beijing and a leader of discussions related to various aspects of globalization, including migration. IOM, the International Organization for Migration, is the leading intergovernmental organization on migration in the world. It recently joined the UN as a related organization and is now the UN's migration agency. CCG and IOM have worked for the fourth time already to make IOM's flagship publication, the World Migration Report, available in Chinese language. I'd like to thank the team at the IOM Beijing and at CCG um, around Xiao Shaoshen and other people to translate uh, this important report. It's my pleasure to be joined today by Dr. Henry Wang, President and Founder of Centers for China and Globalization, and Dr. Jude Seppe Grusetti, the representative of IOM in Beijing. Following both gentlemen's welcome remarks, the World Migration Report will be officially introduced to us by Dr. Mary McOlive, who is the head of my, uh, the Migration Policy Research Division of IOM headquarters in Geneva. We have then in the following a panel, including four distinguished expert panelists, following by question and answers. In the interest of time, I will wear my Swiss German watch today. I would like to ask everyone to keep contributions brief and sharp so that we have enough time for discussion and q and A, I'd like to hand over now and give the word directly to Dr. Henry Wang, um, the president and founder of CCG, to provide him his welcome remarks. Please, Henry, go ahead. Okay, great. Uh, thanks, thanks, Martin. Uh, dear Mr. Crosetti and uh, uh, Dr. Manuel Light and uh, also uh, Professor uh, Geiger and uh, of course distinguished uh, guests uh, and also our live audience. So we have uh, many live audience uh, online as well uh, through uh, broadcasting on several uh, outlets, uh, social media in China. And good afternoon, good good morning, and and a good evening also. So so it's really a great honor, and we had this opportunity to work with. Uh, uh, IOM UN to uh, and also uh, Carlton University to to co-organize this event, which we're going to uh, have the honor of uh, Dr. Manuel Life to give us the pre presentation of uh, World Migration Report, which is a flagship report uh, that has been uh, really uh, very famous in the world. So uh, it's it's not the first time to be introduced in China as. Uh, uh, Martin said this is already our fourth time to introduce China, uh, uh, IOM report to China, which is uh, uh, getting more and more attention. So we have actually seen the world uh, has uh, stepped into the third decades of the 21st century. Of course, development of the globalization uh, and also after the experience of the flow of goods and capital. And now we are actually seeing explosive uh, growth of uh, uh, a development opportunity for the mobility of the population and and also the what has happened in China in the last four decades we have uh, three million migrant workers actually has transformed China and we can see how migration has contributed to the development of China uh, and, and and also certainly there's over one billion migrants around the world has also contributed significantly uh, to the world so so we are very uh, pleased to uh, to have this uh, 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 webinar uh, to share this uh, uh, flagship report of the uh, IOM uh, so that we can promote a safe, orderly, and regular migration 
uh, that has been the consensus uh, of the uh, uh, IOM and also many countries in the world. So, so the, the World Migration Report is, uh, is uh, of course, uh, uh, IOM's uh, flagship publication. It covers the latest data, uh, trends, and global migration, as also the concerns, solutions, and best practices uh, in migration governance. Uh, we find that uh, uh, this has been getting uh, more and more attention in China and uh, has been uh, really a great academic and uh, uh, a lot of uh, work has been put into this report and we have really uh, 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 learned, learned a lot and also through the process of uh, 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 translating into Chinese we find that uh, it's really uh, very very uh, stimulating and also very enriching uh, uh, and also very uh, helpful uh, to the to the Chinese academics and the policymakers and business community. So we see actually even now we are facing unprecedented uh, COVID-19 that uh, we never faced in the history of mankind. This also has a huge impact on, on the migration. And uh, just for example, a number of Chinese students, a number of uh, uh, Chinese diasporas uh, uh, traveling around the world has really been affected by this uh, COVID-19 and not, some of them even cannot be returned. Uh, so that uh, we can see how a, a different culture, how different uh, uh, you know, studies overseas and uh, the, the knowledge and skill and understanding of migration is so important uh, for, 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 for people, uh, for migrants, but also for people in general. Uh, so uh, actually, according to the data of IOM, and uh, in nine, 2019, China has surpassed the Russian with 10.7 million uh, people living uh, outside China, overseas, basically. So you can see the, uh, the China become one of the actually third largest country of emigration in the world. And so, so to better promote the service and the governance, China actually officially established the National Immigration Administration in 2018. And, uh, and also China actually joined the IOM in 2016. Uh, so those are, are milestone events actually in China. And it's also for the uh, last number of years, that IOM, IOM uh, uh, annual report has been getting uh, wider and wider attention. So, so I think that uh, uh, we have a really a great uh, uh, experts uh, gathered uh, also today, and also that uh, we, we we think that uh, for the uh, this this timing is really uh, highly relevant. Uh, that we take a, a really look at this uh, great report. And we have a, a lot of a discussion on that. Um, and also, we, we are really fortunate to work with uh, our, our great friend uh, uh, at IOM. And also, IOM Beijing, IOM China has been playing a, a very active role uh, in, uh, in, uh, in this respect. And also, uh, experts like Martin has been uh, internationally active uh, in, in also researching uh, with China uh, talent mobility uh, between China and Canada and, and Western countries. So as a think tank, as you, uh, you know, as we are one of the leading think tank in, in the ranked among the top 100 think tanks in the world, and migration is really one of our uh, key area of study. And we have been continuously publishing for the last seven, eight years, the annual blue book on, international mig on in China international migration uh, blue book report. And also we have written a book about uh, uh, state um, uh, immigration uh, administration, I think, which is also widely read uh, by China, uh, Chinese policymakers. So we are also very uh, uh, thankful that uh, entrusted by IOM, uh, for the last number of years, we've been uh, translating, editing, and publishing this work uh, in China so that uh, uh, more people can know the work of IOM and so that they can really uh, see what's going on in the world so we can have the best uh, academic research and also the latest uh, research on the IOM uh, uh, scholars and experts networks uh, work that in the Chinese uh, uh, language. So the, uh, the work that CCG is doing uh, is really uh, very uh, uh, relevant and also is really trying to promote this uh, better understanding of uh, uh, orderly and uh, inclusive uh, migration development. I think there's so much international experience 
that we can learn from and uh, on settlement, on, on how to uh, uh, handle the migration issues and how to really serve to the uh, uh, migrant and how to really uh, also have an orderly and, uh, and uh, uh, manageable fashion of uh, uh, you know, the, the, the trans, trans, uh, peaceful uh, and uh, uh, very healthy uh, development of migration uh, uh, within China as well. So again, we want to thank uh, IOM of UN to, to give this uh, trust to CCG. And also we want to thank our CCG team for the uh, hard work of translation, uh, of, of, uh, particularly during the academic year to, to do this report. Uh, and also we want to uh, thank uh, uh, Martin uh, from Universal Carlton uh, to support all this uh, webinar. And I want to really uh, welcome all the uh, panelists and also our live audience. I think as we time goes on, we'll see the increase of our live audience as well. So I just want to share that. And uh, once again, thank you all. And uh, I'm really looking forward to the discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Wang. And I will hand over. It's my pleasure to welcome uh, Giuseppe Grossetti, uh, who is the Chief of Mission of IOM in Beijing, for his welcome yeah. remarks. Please, Giuseppe. Thank you very much, Dr. Peter, and thank you, Dr. Wang, for your support in hosting today's virtual launch of the 2020 World Migration Report in China, followed by what will surely be very engaging and highly qualified panel discussion. Indeed, IOM has had the pleasure to partner with CCG now for a number of years in the release of the Chinese edition of IOM's flagship publication, World Migration Report which constantly features amongst the top downloaded publications on IOM's website. The report provides a useful evidence base on migration topics and trends globally, and it is a key tool to help all of us, its scholars, practitioners, and policymakers, navigate such complex issues, particularly at this time of uncertainty when COVID-19 outbreaks demands both a balanced reflection and informed action. And in this regard, I really want to encourage webinar participants to download the report and help further disseminate it through your networks. Now more than ever before, more information on migration has become available to us globally. However, the interconnectedness of the world we live in means that often statistical data are alone inadequate to fully capture the dynamic, complex, and fast-paced nature of migration processes. And it is widely recognized that migration is influenced by and contributes vice versa to influence development, let alone geopolitical considerations. However, the rapid expansion in transnational connectivity, which the report touched on, further accelerated by adaptation strategies to COVID-19, is now presenting new and highly diversified challenges and opportunities in migration processes. It is in this context that it becomes increasingly relevant to stay abreast of trends and developing patterns in migration. And we in IOM very much hope that you do find this report a valuable reference tool in your everyday work. IOM's new strategic vision, which was first presented to its member states at the last IOM Council, provides for the organization to be a strong and balanced voice in this increasingly toxic and polarized migration discourse. And to do so, it does need to be a source of credible information on migration data and trends, which is exactly what this report attempts to do. The 2020 World Migration Report was first launched at the Iron Council meeting late last year, and that is prior to COVID-19 outbreak. Then early this year, COVID-19 came along, and reminded us just how volatile the world is becoming and how likely the world is to experience an increasing number of migration shocks over the next decade for which governments across the globe need to prepare. Over the past months, Iowa Migration Policy Research Division, whose head, Dr. Mary McCauley, is with us today, has published about 50 analytical snapshots on COVID-19, framing this issue from different angles. And these snapshots are currently being translated into Chinese and will soon be made available to all those interested in further assessing the present and projected impact 
of COVID-19 on migration and mobility. Recently, the United Nations Secretary General's policy brief on COVID-19 and people on the move stressed how COVID-19 disproportionate impact on people on the move presents us with an opportunity to reimagine human mobility for the benefit of all in a renewed effort to leave no one behind in the spirit of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. In Secretary General's words, exclusion is costly in the long run, whereas inclusion pays off for everyone. No one is safe until everyone is safe. And these takeaways equals the commitments that countries around the world made at the time of the adoption of the Global Compact on Safe, Regular and Orderly Migration in 2018, and also reflect on the hard-taught lessons that no country can fight this virus alone, just like no countries can manage migration alone. The notion of renewed partnership naturally brings me then to our webinar, which is testimony of IOM's continued and fruitful partnership with think tanks and academia, represented today by CCG and Carlton University, respectively. Indeed, good migration governance, and we will hear more about it during the final discussion, requires both wall of government and wall of society efforts, due to the invaluable role that think tank, academia, media also represent today, private sector, the UN, various other international organizations, and the broader civil society can play. The new established United Nations Network on Migration, for which ION serves as coordinator and secretariat, will be a key gateway to strengthening partnerships across the system in this respect. Before I hand back, I would like to conclude my short remarks by thanking once again our host, Dr. Wang, and the whole team at the CCG for being a long term partner of IOM, and also Dr. Giger, a well known expert and friend of IOM and all our distinguished panelists who have agreed to be with us today to reflect together on the relevance of the World Migration Report's insights to policy research priorities of the academic community in China and globally. Thank you. Thank you so much, Giuseppe Corsetti, the Chief of Mission of the IOM in Beijing. And it's now my pleasure to hand over uh, to Dr. Mary McAuliffe of IOM. She is heading the Migration Policy Research Section uh, at IOM headquarters, and she's joining us from Geneva. Please, Mary, go ahead. Thank you so much, uh, Martin, and please allow me uh, the latitude to also uh, express my thanks uh, to CCG and Dr. Wang and his team, again, for translating IOM's World Migration Report and being an ongoing partner with IOM. I'd also really like to thank uh, Giuseppe Crocetti, my uh, chief of mission and our very uh, valued colleague in Beijing, who has set the groundwork for us through this presentation, but also as he mentioned, in regards to uh, supporting the translation of the World Migration Report and other products that are coming out shortly on COVID-19 and the impacts on migration and mobility. So special thanks to, to Giuseppe and his team uh, for all the work he's doing in Beijing. Now, very quickly, I'm conscious um, that Martin is a Swiss German, so he's very keenly uh, <laughs> astute in terms of time. I shall try and keep this brief, including because what we intended to do uh, during this webinar is really provide just the initial taste in regards to the World Migration Report and encourage you, as Giuseppe mentioned, to go into the report, uh, to download it. It is a very long report. Uh, and there is a lot of very rich data and the latest research and analysis on migration. We'll talk about that in a moment, but there is a wealth of information uh, on truly a world migration report. We often suffer in terms of seeing a lot of research and analysis in certain parts of the world, uh, Europe, North America and other parts. Um, this is something that we really are very conscious of, so we very much try and make this a genuine world migration report. Very quick presentation outline for you. We really just touch on the key contributions and the highlights of the 2020 report. As both um, Dr. Wang and also Giuseppe mentioned, 
the analysis and the production are particularly important in terms of this era of misinformation on migration. So we put a lot of effort into quality assurance and partnerships, so, which is one of the reasons, uh, obviously, why we work with CCG in regards to the translation of the World Migration Report. And then in the context of the pandemic, there are just two very short slides, uh, really for some overarching takeaways in regards to COVID-19 and what we are starting to see in regards to migration and mobility systems around the world. This is our mission. I won't read it, but I'll allow the, uh, our translators and, and thanks very much to them for all of their work in terms of translating today for us. I've highlighted in bold the part that is central to IOM's mission and how the world migration fits in uh, very clearly to our mission and to our uh, ongoing strategy around ensuring that we have an evidence-based understanding of migration issues, which as others have mentioned, can become uh, geopolitically kind of uh, instrumentalized, shall we say. So that this is how the World Migration Report fits into IOM's uh, mission and its key objectives. I'm not going to read this out, but I, I would encourage you to actually go and read the full forward, which is translated now, of course, into Chinese. This is from IOM's Director General, Antonio Vittorini, Vittorino, and of course, it goes straight to the heart of why we're producing the World Migration Report. Okay, as, as some of you may know, we did a review of the World Migration Report, which it commenced as a series and a flagship publication in the year 2000. Uh, we did a review in 2016, just as IOM was entering the United Nations officially. And we found that we needed to, because of the salience of migration globally and its, and its very significant growth in terms of interest, we needed to revise the report and move it from a single theme. Some may recall and, uh, that the 2015 report, for example, was on a fairly narrow theme of migrants and cities. And of course, IOM produces uh, around 200 publications on migration every year. Uh, but we felt that we needed to expand the coverage of the report so that it could speak to uh, researchers, to students, to officials, uh, to the media especially, to our member states and the work that they have to do uh, in terms of managing and uh, working on migration, as well as practitioners and civil society. So we revised it to have part one, which is the key data and information on migration and migrants. We do a global chapter, a big broad brush overview, as well as a regional chapter. And then in part two, we change the thematic topics from report to report. So in the 2020 edition, we have a number of key topics for those people who are working on migration, who are studying migration and are interested in doing a more deep dive into specific areas such as migration, inclusion and social cohesion, for example. I've just put in uh, one of the tables, one of the first tables in the report, which, which again goes to highlighting the salience uh, issue. And this is really just a very quick kind of overview in terms of, again, stressing uh, the growth in, in visibility, in profile, in importance in migration. And part of that is related, of course, to the dynamics of migration and the movement of migrants uh, themselves. So we, we are very conscious of the current geopolitical context, of course, and we provide key statistics and recent developments, but we're trying to put the recent developments in a broader historical context. In terms of IOM itself, you can see that the number of member states since 2000, when the first report was launched, has increased uh, significantly, and the field presence, of course, for IOM uh, has increased also tremendously. The global overview chapter is specifically designed to look at the really big picture on migration. 
to really look at the latest data and trends on international migrants, as well as international migration, all the flows and the movements of people. We have a look at specific migrant uh, groups, such as migrant workers, uh, such as uh, refugees and asylum seekers and internally displaced persons. And we also draw on the growing uh, body of IOM programmatic and operational data. Now, this isn't necessarily global in nature, but it can provide some very, very um, important insights into what is actually occurring at the ground level in regards to issues concerning missing migrants or assisted voluntary return, displacement tracking, and so on and so forth. We spend a lot of time and effort uh, interrogating and understanding and analysing uh, the data to show patterns and trends and differences across regions. Uh, for these outputs, we work uh, very closely with um, an academic who is a professor at the Shanghai University, uh, Professor Gaia Bell, who's one of the leading uh, migration data specialists in the world. And we've worked um, over a number of years now to develop visual uh, depictions of migration that are able to capture both the nuance, but also the trends, as well as comparative analysis across different regions. And here we have on the left, a figure showing migrants to, within and from Europe. And you can see that it is very different to the figure on the right, which is looking at Latin America and the Caribbean. So very quickly readers, researchers, students, uh, officials can flick through the report and see how the trends and the changes in migration have occurred over the last uh, 30 years as the case is for this particular series. We also use data to show patterns, trends and differences in regards to regions where there are substantial changes occurring that can be highlighted visually with impact in regards to population and proportional population change, which of course, as a demographer, um, I know that uh, migration is often the hardest variable to actually quantify and to do projections on and estimations on, but it is one of the most important. And as Dr. Wang mentioned earlier, in an increasing globalizing uh, environment, we are seeing international migration expand. And this is where, for example, on the left-hand side, we have population decline occurring in Europe. The need for migrant workers uh, can be significant in certain parts of Europe. And on the right, we have Latin America and the Caribbean and showing very clearly the population growth that has occurred over time there. We also use data to show complexity. So for example, uh, Africa is the, the most uh, pointed in regards to and the most obvious in regards to the differences in uh, hosting as well as producing refugees and asylum seekers. And we can see that there are very many countries who might be hosting refugees, but are also origin countries of refugees. Uh, Sudan, uh, the Democratic Republic of the Congo, and to some extent, South Sudan definitely fall within uh, that category. So we use some of the data and the visuals to show some of the really complex issues related to migration. I'll just put this one up on the screen. I won't uh, read it out, but again, it is um, available on our website. Uh, one of the things that we do, we're very keen to uh, explore is really looking at some of the assumptions and some of the narrative discussions which are not supported by data. So some of the more interesting facts that a lot of people are not necessarily aware of. For example, we just have a few there. Uh, that France, for example, is the sixth top receiving country of international remittances. Germany is uh, the ninth. And of course, uh, China is the second. Uh, and this is 2018 data uh, from the World Bank. Our lead thematic chapter in the World Migration Report 2020 is on migrants' contributions in an era of increasing disruption and disinformation. Uh, little did we know when we were producing this chapter for the World Migration Report that it would become even more relevant in the context of COVID-19. And we have seen increasing um, uh, xenophobic racism and misinformation and disinformation in regards to migrants 
and mobility in the context of COVID-19, which I'm sure we will get onto uh, later in the discussion. One of the key things, of course, uh, that we really focus on in this, in this research uh, chapter is the need for balanced public discussions and the scrutiny of fake media content. We put great emphasis on migrant-centric uh, research and understanding the, the experiences of migrants. We're seeing that come up in COVID-19 as well, and it's a really important uh, sort of reminder for us. We'll talk about remittances a little bit later. And then, of course, the structural issues. Those are the policy kind of issues uh, in regards to, to supporting uh, migrants' contributions in a range of different settings. Here are the other thematic chapters, which I uh, mentioned earlier. Now, very quickly in terms of partnerships, this is really important to us. This is something that we have uh, grown uh, very much over time. We know that um, our work is only strengthened through partnerships with academic and applied researchers. Uh, we have all of the chapters peer reviewed uh, by IOM experts internally, but also by academic uh, reviewers. And it's been a very significant boost for us in terms of maintaining the quality and the rigor of the report. We also work with a lot of external co-authors and contributors, some of whom work in uh, academia and some of whom work in applied uh, research settings around the world. And of course, as mentioned uh, many times already, in terms of the translations, uh, CCG has been a long-term partner in terms of translating the World Migration Report, IOM's flagship, into Chinese. I should also mention too that we are starting uh, for the first time to really move beyond the UN languages. And this falls in the context of development, most definitely. Um, Portuguese, for example, chapter one is already available, but chapters two and three are currently underway. And we've just uh, commenced uh, translations into German and also into Swahili. It would be wonderful if we could also provide more languages, and it's certainly something that is on a future agenda for us. But um, at the moment, fundraising is um, taking up a lot of time for the next report, shall we say. Now, the last two slides, very quickly, I uh, really want to just touch on a few uh, points. As uh, Giuseppe mentioned earlier, we have been doing a lot of work on COVID-19 and the transformations of migration and mobility globally. And we do have a very much a global uh, kind of focus. We are seeing that this is a seismic geopolitical event that will transform migration and mobility systems. I think everybody understands that, but we're not entirely sure yet. We're still you know, reasonably early in the pandemic to understand exactly what that is going to look like uh, post COVID-19. It has become the great disruptor. And what I'm talking about here is the immobility, the travel restrictions uh, globally that have been unprecedented are disrupting migration uh, patterns and processes and systems uh, around the world. The initial research and analysis, but this is only being strengthened, I think, um, over time, is showing that the most vulnerables in societies are the most affected uh, by COVID-19. Of course, this relates to socioeconomic um, issues, but we do find, for example, migrants, including refugees, often in those very vulnerable uh, settings, and they are the ones who are uh, very much uh, feeling the brunt of the pandemic globally. We also know that um, the post-pandemic recovery will be strongly linked to migration and mobility systems. And part of that is that international remittances will be key. We're already uh, seeing some countries experience increases in remittances during COVID-19. And this is despite the projected declines for 2020 globally. In, on the one hand, uh, it's likely, highly likely, that we will see declines over the longer term, medium and longer term. But at the moment, it's also uh, intuitive that if your family is facing COVID-19 issues and very significant issues in terms of, you know, uh, food and shelter and poverty alleviation type mechanisms, that people will want to send more money home if they can. And that is the, the key thing, one of the aspects 
uh, that we've been talking about uh, recently with partners is the need to reduce uh, the costs of remittances, for example, to open up remittance channels and so forth. We know from some of the data that is starting to come through that migrants are on the front line in destination countries, in origin countries, performing essential work, but they are also at the forefront of responding to socioeconomic impact. And that is through remittances to be able to provide a buffer for their families uh, back home. As you can imagine, the next World Migration Report that will be released at the end of next year, there will be a thematic chapter. It will be the lead chapter um, for part two, and that will be on COVID-19, migration and mobility. There is a lot more to come, of course, in this space, but we're starting to work on that uh, now. Lastly, I'll just leave this slide up. Um, we have been, uh, like most people, very interested in um, bringing together partners to really look at the impact on COVID-19. We've started to do some high level kind of think pieces uh, through our migration research uh, high level advisors uh, network. And we've also recently released two publications on gender and COVID-19 supported by the Australian Department of Foreign Affairs Gender Equality Unit. And we've just started to release some migration research series papers on COVID-19. As Giuseppe mentioned, we have now more than 50 analytical snapshots uh, on migration and mobility impacts. The last two were posted over the weekend, uh, including updates to mobility regimes and also international students, which is a key issue, of course. I will leave it there. Thank you, Martin. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. McAuliffe. Um, and now the content of, uh, was of the World Migration Report was introduced. And um, I think it's a very important report and also the analytical snapshots that are released uh, uh, right frequently uh, over the last, have been released over the last few months are very important. I say that also as a teacher, uh, preparing now my online courses uh, on migration and this collection, the World Migration Report is always for uh, guiding my students as well and giving them actually exactly the data and the slides they sometimes need and so on to present. So thank you so much for, for introducing to us this important report. And um, as was mentioned, um, most chapters probably were written of the World Migration Report before this pandemic broke out. And um, so today, what we're going to do is actually in our uh, panel discussion with our experts, and uh, Mary, please join us then as well, um, is um, to, to look first actually at the general peak, perhaps, pre-COVID-19, before COVID-19, and then actually in a second round of discussion, focus on COVID-19 and why, what might be the impacts and what we uh, might be expected. Um, to say one thing, um, migration is here to stay and it remains important, though we are currently perhaps at a very unique moment in world time, to, to almost have a standstill in mobility, right? But certain forms of migration are also continuing to flow. I say that now from a Canadian perspective and uh, as rightly pointed out, and I think it uh, really be stressed the point is many migrant workers are frontline workers are uh, performing essential tasks. And I think also the gender dimension is very important to look at that and the remittance dimension that was mentioned by Dr. McAuliffe. So it's my pleasure now to start uh, our panel discussion. Um, and with me today are Professor Lu. She is an associate professor at the Institute of Development Studies, Southwestern University of Finance and Economics, and Professor Wei Shen, who is the associate pro vice chancellor for international relations at Deakin University. Furthermore, I have also the pleasure to introduce Ms. Dr. Yadi Tsang who holds since recently a PhD and is both a lecturer at the School of Journalism at Chongqing University and also an assistant researcher at the Center for Non-Traditional Security and Peaceful Development Studies in Zhejiang University. And last but not least, we have Professor Sang, who is the Dean at the School of International Studies Academy of Overseas Chinese and also the Director of the Center for Transnational Migration Studies, a very important migration center at Jinan University. Guangzhou. 
we will directly start off and aim then to address some questions that were circulated beforehand are printed actually on the program. I start first with the same question addressed to one of our scholars based in China and then the same question to someone who is based outside China but uh, is very well uh, aware of all the trends who is just, uh, based in Australia uh, but previously for a longer while has been based in Europe. So my first question is directed actually to Professor Liu in, in Chengdu and Professor Shen in, uh, based currently in Australia. So Professor Liu, being one of the experts in China on migration and listening to today's presentation of the World Migration Report, what are in your view relevant insights, takeaways from the report and in what sense is it good to have actually the, uh, the report in a Chinese language and uh, have this available? What does it mean for scholar discussions and wider public discussions in China in view you? Please go ahead. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Martin. Um, it's uh, actually a great pleasure to be part of this event because World Migration Report has been one of my must read sources when I'm conducting my own research on migration. Uh, so based on uh, this latest report and also my own research on uh, and experiences with Chinese migrants and returnees, uh, I would like to share some thoughts which I hope may contribute a little bit to our conversations today. Um, I think a couple of keywords uh, in this report I echo my thoughts quite a bit on the words of uncertainty and change. Uh, so I find one change among all the trends of global, uh, global migration is particularly interesting. Uh, that is uh, between 2013 and 2017, uh, high income countries experienced a slight drop in migrant workers. Uh, but the upper in middle income countries observed the biggest increase of migrant workers. So it's an increase of 13 million. So this significant increase of migrant workers in these countries shows that some developing countries have become attractive de uh, destinations for migrants, globally or regionally. Uh, so I have read a lot research on, uh, let's say, brain circulation or and the reverse migration between particular countries. Uh, but I think this uh, report actually provides a really clear evidence that circulation of migrants, workers, and return migrations are not just trickles here and there, but actually become main flows. So let's take China as an example. Uh, China is classified as an upper middle income country in this report also by the World Bank. So from 2010 to 2018, the annual population of returnees back to China increased nearly four times. And also the population of foreign students and foreign workers in China has doubled. So in China, all these people uh, are generally considered as uh, international talent. So since 2000, China has been implementing numbers of policies and programs at levels of uh, both central and local governments to target and attract international talents um, to China. So after two decades, uh, we can see the increasing population of uh, returnees, international uh, students, and uh, uh, Im uh, skilled migrants in China. So, but some scholars also uh, uh, question uh, the effect of those policies uh, in terms of whether or not uh, they can attract the very best, the very top uh, of the global talent. So, and also some uh, argue and uh, talk about uh, asking the question like how long these talents will stay in China, especially uh, international students and the foreign workers. So with all the increasing number of immigrant populations, uh, sorry, um, in China, I believe issues like social inclusions of international migra migrants, diversity and social cohesion, and the relationship to migrants and the communities would become emerging and the pressing uh, areas of research in China, not only for the academic community, but also for the government. Uh, we know for the first time, China established the national 
uh, to provide better uh, governance and services to foreigners in China. And the requirements for permanent residency in China have been gradually relaxed. And also the permanent residence uh, uh, card has been integrated into the system uh, to be an official Chinese ID of foreigners in China. And also lately, I've uh, been working with some local government uh, officials to do policy research on international talents. Uh, I noticed that there have been more talks about how to support and retain the international talents in China than simply how to attract them. So it's not that they care less about attracting skilled migrants, it's more that they also recognize the importance of migrants' uh, inclusion in China's society. So in general, we can see an open and inclusive and supportive, supportive mm -hmm. social environment uh, for international migrants would be a great and positive impact Thanks. on talent uh, attraction. Um, mm -hmm. Thank you so much, hello? Professor Liu. Yeah. Yes, yeah. yes. Thank you so much for your remarks. And I want to hand over to Professor Shen now. And uh, we should mention also, and that's very important, the Chinese community abroad is also a very significant scholarly community. And we have many Chinese scholars actually working in many countries on migration, and Professor Shen is one of them. So I would like to ask you the same question, um, the World Migration Report and the Chinese edition, and what is the relevance um, yeah, for you of research and uh, you as a scholar. And perhaps if you can speak also the policy community, the business community perhaps, yeah. Yeah, thank you very much, Martin. This is a really a, a privilege to be part of this discussion. And it's almost, it's also very special because having been an, a researcher at IOM in 2003, nearly 17 years ago, and that's also how I knew about uh, Henry's uh, work on international migration. It's great to be part of this panel. And uh, also I want to, continue what um, Professor Lu has said and uh, my research is also focused on international student migration and, uh, and also the brain circulation. And uh, I just want to say that in the last uh, decade, you know, international students, international student flows have grown uh, very significantly. Uh, the UNESCO report in 2000, there, was, uh, there were 2 million students, international students, but it became 5.3 million international students in 2017. And I think this kind of growing trend is also confirmed by the latest World Migration Report. Uh, one of the chapter deals with East Asia actually highlighted the importance of um, East Asia being both uh, outward and inward student uh, mobility. And uh, particularly in, uh, students from China have grown very, um, very high you know, in Australia and New Zealand in the parts I mean, you know, China's, Chinese students are certainly the number one um, uh, population group. Um, in, in among the universities here. And also what I want to say that, um, that the report is important for China is, as, as Professor Lu has said, you know, China is not only a sending country for international students, it's also becoming a very important receiving uh, country for international students and skill migration in general. And uh, what we can see that uh, there's a growing regionalization already prior to COVID-19, where the students are more likely to study within their regions. Uh, for instance, China is now the a biggest, uh, you know, a, a very important destination for Korean students. And um, uh, nearly, you know, uh, it's, 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 you know, um, in China, Korean students are the most, uh, um, it's, it's the largest group of international students in China which has grown you know, very significantly in the last uh, few years. And this is also due to a number of policies, initiatives from China, for instance, in the higher education sector, the, the double first class initiatives, and the more global level, the Belt Road initiative, where there's a kind of a drive to attract international students and, and talents to study and live in China. And um, recently, uh, I also finished a, a multi-year project with uh, Frank Peek from Leiden University called Immigrant China. And the project is a Sino-European collaboration with a number of European partners. And our uh, starting point for this project is to look at China is not just a purely ascending country, but increasingly become a destination country. And the student, uh, the, 
the type of migrations to China vary from region to region. So from certain parts of China, we, we see a lot of marriage migration, for instance, the border with Russia or the border with Southeast Asia. In Shanghai, in Beijing, big cities, we see a flow of international students. Um, we look at you know, also business in, uh, and also um, traders in EU and in Guangzhou, mainly from Africa and Arab, Arab countries. And my particular research team really look at uh, highly skilled migration, uh, especially European students and European scientists in Chinese universities. And one of the findings really um, um, echo what uh, the previous speaker has said is, you know, it's not only get them to China, but also to integrate them. I think this is a, a very critical point, how the integration of, you know, international uh, residents in China. And the, also the integration, you know, varies from different types of migration. Integration of student may be different from uh, integration of uh, a business person or trader. And uh, so this is becoming a very important uh, issue. So I, I really think, you know, the report of the world migration um, is, is really important. It has a huge um, implication for the policy community, communities, but also for universities and the business uh, communities and the non-governmental organizations. And uh, I just, you know, I'm sure we will discuss that later, but the impact of COVID-19 really have um, fundamental yeah. implications and impacts for student migration, which I look forward to the discussion later on. Thank you, Martin. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Shen. And um, it has been mentioned now as well, uh, and International Students Chinese group is a very important one. I say that as again, from a Canadian perspective, most of our students are from China. And uh, also we see an increasing number of international students going to China. And I had the pleasure to visit various universities, including also Jinan University and Professor Sung's University where you have actually the same diversity in the classroom that you have actually in a Canadian university. And that means really a lot. And I think the points highlighted that it's also about the retention and actually to make sure the integration works and there is a, a balance and an orderly approach to migration and integration is very important and was highlighted now at various times already. So we stay actually still in the context of before COVID-19. And I would like to ask now, um, yeah, almost same similar questions to Dr. Song, uh, from Zhongqing University. Um, so bringing you in as uh, uh, one of the newer researchers on, on migration in China, I would like to ask you first, what's the importance also of this report for actually a still very emerging field of migration studies in China? And secondly, what has been actually the role of migration for Chinese societies? And you can also focus definitely on the Chinese community abroad because you have been studying protection of overseas worker. Yeah, please go ahead. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thanks, Martin. And thanks, Martin, for having me in this webinar. And uh, it is my great pleasure to be here and to share my opinions and ideas with, uh, with you. And uh, Actually, the first two questions, uh, I think during the last five decades and the China has become a very top and um, important uh, migration sending country and also the migration receiving country as a lot of professors and experts said before. And uh, so I'm quite interested in the topic um, that how migration studies evolve in China or in China's academia. And so um, uh, analysis that uh, um, a lot of, uh, uh, so I read a lot of the re um, articles and uh, reports about uh, the China's migration studies. And uh, um, so I think the word migration report is quite important for the China's academia especially in analyzing the migration studies. So we can, because we can use a lot of the data and the facts and uh, from this report. And uh, we also can, and uh, this, uh, this report can open up very uh, useful and uh, um, quite a good platform for the China's experts to exchange their ideas. And uh, um, it kind of the, um, how to say, the builds a bridge for the Chinese Chinese experts to the uh, IOM experts or the international expert, experts, so I think this report is really, really very, um, really important for for us. 
So um, yeah, that is my opinion. Yeah. Thanks Thank you so much. Thank you very much for your contribution, uh, Yeri. And I should mention that we recently actually published together a paper where we looked at the existing yes. Amer uh, migration studies in, in China and has, how it has de developed. And we identify actually CCG as a key focal point in China on migration studies and actually providing multiple platforms for discussion and also as a very important uh, yeah, organizer of a lot of events. And uh, we have been meeting, or all of us here have been meeting regularly at CCG's yes. annual conferences on, on global migration and talent mobility. And uh, CCG is also, we mentioned several times, the topic of international student mobility is actually also a really important in releasing regular reports on this topic uh, as well. Yeah. So last but not least, I would like to bring in Professor Sang from Jinan University. And I already mentioned I had the pleasure to visit uh, him and his university and his students and uh, was quite impressed by actually uh, how many uh, international students they are uh, and, and how important that field also the discussions of migration are for them. And I would like to bring you in and actually already with your help start a bit our second round of discussion because Professor Sang is a leading expert on the Chinese overseas community and as well, or of course, also very strongly interested in governance issues and governance of migration. And um, so we had really uh, wonderful conversations uh, already together. So I first would like to ask you also, as a leading uh, expert on Chinese overseas, um, this group is so numerous, it is so important. Um, the World Migration Report really highlighted how can this group actually contribute to the development of global migration governance and what do you see is the role of this uh, very important uh, group community. And my second question would be to you to start directly the next uh, round of discussion what extent is actually COVID-19 really a game changer for the Chinese overseas community and um, the way we think about migration and also migration governance? Thank you. Please go ahead. Uh, okay. Uh, okay. Good day, everyone. Uh, so good. Eve uh, yeah, actually, good afternoon here, but uh, morning and uh, uh, so uh, yeah, very uh, to be very honored to to participate in this uh, in a workshop. As Martin's question, I think the first of all, uh, China in Chinese, uh, you know, uh, academic community, there are many scholars. They are doing the this migration studies, but generally not very much, uh, not uh, not very many. Are, they are doing transnational, you know, and migration. Uh, but in terms of the overseas Chinese studies, and generally we use the Chinese diaspora, but, but, in, you know, but in China, actually we have a very independent uh, group of scholars. You know, we, have our, uh, we have our own uh, you know, uh, just research group, the International Society for the Studies of Chinese Overseas. But overseas chi Chinese overseas studies are very, uh, important and independent uh, group of scholars. Uh, of course, they are multidisciplinary, but basically, there are many. You know, they are doing history, uh, sociology. And so, I think this report and um, is going to be a very important. Uh, you know, shedding the new lights actually to help this group of scholars. If you take the uh, the example of my institution, you know, we are one of the. Uh, and you can see we're the School of International Studies, but also Academy of Overseas Chinese Studies. And uh, this uh, institution was chosen by the Ministry of, of, uh, of Education you know, to name as one of the key research you know, center. Uh, so we are mobilizing a lot of you know, uh, scholars doing this uh, Chinese over, uh, overseas Chinese studies. Uh, but generally, uh, you know, I'm also a newcomer because I'm doing, you know, international relations and uh, and also the people, uh, you know, people's mobility and international relations. But when I'm coming to this group of scholars of the overseas Chinese studies group, you know, I found actually they are quite independent, and uh, 
they are all doing, you know, either the history, you know, the, the, the economy, the, the politics of Chinese overseas. They are not very international. And uh, later on, actually, uh, you know, I think under a lot of a new endeavor, you know, like the CCG, you know, like uh, by our own, the people, the scholars of this group, they are moving to a much more, you know, international perspective. On one hand, uh, you know, we are trying to put the Chinese overseas, uh, you know, as one of the, uh, you know, one group of the you know, migration studies. And of course, it's the Chinese, uh, you know, Chinese emigration. And, uh, and of course, we have another part, you know, like the previous scholars, they all mentioned that Chinese immigration. Uh, yeah, but anyway, I think this new report, you know, and th this report, and actually uh, gave some new, very new perspective to help uh, the group of scholars of the uh, overseas Chinese studies, you know, to study the Chinese is not Chinese, scholar, you know, migration is not very, you know, we are particular. But we are not. We are also general, you know, in terms of the international, my, you know, my migration. So, uh, yeah, that's why I actually, if you take our uh, institution as example, and more, more and more students, they are doing the Ch overseas Chinese studies. But now they are much taking the international perspective, you know, uh, from the international organizations like uh, IOM, and you know, they are studying. They are doing comparison with the Chinese diaspora and and other you know like india diaspora in south uh, southeast asia so this is a yeah i think the you know it's a one of the very very important uh, thing that's why you know i think we should uh, thank thanks the ccg very much and uh, they are doing a very good job uh, but on the other hand i think this is also a reflect uh, emerging interest you know, of the Chinese community, of the Chinese uh, scholars community. Uh, we are doing more and more international and, and studies. And in terms of, you know, more like what we have discussed and a lot of, you know, China, of course, in the report, China it was not on, on that list, uh, not yet we are receiving, but actually more and more uh, China are becoming uh, receiving country of migration students, but also the like small traders, you know, the cities I'm living in, like in Guangzhou, uh, you know, so there's a large, uh, you know, uh, actually more and more uh, foreigners, small traders actually, uh, for example, from African, you know, they are coming to Guangzhou. And that's why uh, there is a, a, a very, you know, influential group called CEC, uh, Chinese in Africa, Africans in China. You know, more and more scholars, they are doing this uh, and kind of research. So, and generally, I think this report actually helped uh, the overseas Chinese studies community, you know, how to change our, uh, our research and, and perspective. So, I, yeah, I think this is quite important. Thank you, Professor Song. Mm -hmm. um, I also should mention here at this point, because we have talking, been talking about China becoming also a, a destination, and Professor Liu mentioned actually also the talent attraction, and that was mentioned also of the retention of international students. And um, there's quite a focus on, on actually China attracting new flows. And um, yeah, on this aspect, because we talk also about governance and how actually the future of politics could, could look like or, the, or regulation of mission. And I think we should mention in this context also like new global frameworks like the UN Compact on Migration and other uh, frameworks that are developing. Um, it is very interesting uh, to mention that uh, CCG has been also leading at the international um, from uh, a new initiative and it was actually introduced to the Paris Peace Forum. It uh, is about a global talent organization, an alliance of organizations, HETO. And I would like briefly uh, to ask Dr. Wang to tell us a bit about this initiative because I think it's very important also as we move into post-pandemic situation and we have to relaunch economies and as Dr. McAuliffe uh, already highlighted, migration will play a key role in actually this process. So I, I would like to ask you, Henry, to, to briefly introduce to us the initiative a little bit. Yeah, 
Thank you. Okay. Okay. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Martin, and uh, thank you, uh, uh, Mary, and also uh, Chrisiti, and uh, and also our distinguished panelists for the previous talk. Uh, uh, my staff was telling me now we have uh, two hundred thousand viewers online and uh, uh, watching us on, uh, live actually. So so that shows uh, you know this kind of late afternoon rush hour time we have so many people uh, still on, online to, to watch us. So so it's quite attractive. Uh, what, what I think uh, briefly want to mention is that, uh, you know, uh, China being the largest uh, uh, talent mobility country, probably, for example, we have uh, 700,000 students went abroad, go to, goes abroad every year. Uh, we have, uh, you know, uh, uh, over half a million comes back. So China is probably the largest to bring a circulation country in the world because uh, every year you have more than half a million going out, more than half a million come back. And then you have actually uh, over 1 million uh, 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 expatriates or foreign nationalities working in China. And that number has, as uh, the issue was mentioned, has been doubling for the last few years. And China has set up a, the, the new administration of a national administration of uh, migration. So, so I think that uh, uh, for, for, for NGO, you know, uh, I'm on the steering committee of Paris Peace Forum because uh, Paris Peace Forum uh, is really looking for NGO proposals on how to contribute uh, to the global governance and globalization uh, uh, management. So, so I think that um, being China is one of the largest focus center on, on the talent mobility, it may be good for China to learn from the rest of the world. So maybe we can you know, bring the expertise of IOM, uh, IOO, and uh, you know, uh, OECD and many others. We actually, uh, so alliance of a global talent organization uh, has been, uh, has been proposed in the last few years and have been uh, promoted by Paris Peace Forum and OECD. We, we've been there to talk to them. And also we have invited the, uh, you know, uh, Chris City, Mr. Chris City to, to uh, you know, also join us for Hong Kong uh, uh, conference last year on, on, the, on the feasibility study of that. So I think this is very interesting to, to practice, to, to really compare the best practice. What are the suitable policies? What are the uh, you know, the exchanges that we can learn from each other and uh, particularly doing this kind of a, on the highly skilled part. So, so I think this is really relevant, very relevant. And we hope that uh, we can work with our uh, closely and uh, we can really uh, to bring this large uh, talent uh, mobility part of China into uh, this kind of uh, uh, international exchanges so that we can learn from each other, we can exchange from each other and we can really, uh, because this is the trend and for the future with all the uh, AI uh, with automation, you know, high tech and uh, all those uh, uh, international uh, e-commerce. So, so I think this talent part, we play more and more important role and we have to learn from each other. So, so I think that can be a new area we can contribute uh, to, the, to, the, uh, to this great uh, world migration uh, development. So I really appreciate all the great uh, talks we have uh, today and I want to thank IOM uh, for uh, presenting this great report. Thank you so much, Dr. Wang. And um, I think in this context, uh, we should also mention uh, a Peace Forum uh, last uh, year. We were there with uh, actually Frank Lasko was on board, who is also a leading IOM expert. So we have been discussing this uh, with leading international organizations. And I think this alliance or this project is very important because the Chinese community abroad is massively important in actually around the world in promoting innovation. And uh, actually a lot of the students are in the so-called STEM field. And it has been very important also for China's development, right, to return migration as well. The return, um, and, and Dr. Wang is actually the leading expert on, on the return flows as well and how it has promoted business development and entrepreneurship, right? So I think this is a very important group uh, to look at and to include in any discussion of uh, future global governance on migration and actually how to restart actually not only particular countries but around the world relaunch economies uh, post COVID-19. So we already mentioned it, COVID-19 several times. It's a, it's a massive game changer, or as Dr. McAuliffe calls it, a migration disruptor, but it's also a game changer definitely of how we think actually. And uh, if we think about it more broadly, migration simply as one type of, of very specific type of mobility, and not everyone wants to stay forever abroad. Actually, the Chinese examples sh shows 
that most students return again and it's actually more about circulation and I think this is important because uh, how we look at it if we start from regular travels business travels that might become like more continuous forms of yeah, engagement with particular countries, business context, and so on, perhaps then leading at some point to, to settlement, uh, if not, perhaps continue uh, mobility. Um, I think it's very important to look at this process. And um, uh, I really think we should also mention in this perspective, the Belt and Road Initiative and other projects, the European Union neighborhood policy and the mobility partnerships the European Union is promoting uh, and so on. So I think I start now uh, definitely our second round of discussion and let's talk now about COVID-19 and how we think it is uh, already impacting perhaps on flows. And I want to start with you, Wei, um, and based now in Australia, but having lived also a long time and studied in, in uh, migration in the European case and now being in Australia for a while already and uh, yeah, being connected to uh, Chinese uh, overseas community of scholars. What do you currently see what is going on and to what extent is COVID-19 uh, impacting and a game changer in our thinking on migration? Go ahead. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Martin. I just want to say, you know, I totally agree with you. Migration is not any more one-way traffic. It's becoming more popular. And uh, as we call, you know, the overseas Chinese, you have the seaweeds, sea turtles, and the sea goose. So seaweeds, you know, and sea turtles, uh, you know, sea turtles are returning to, to, to China, and the sea goose are kind of flying between China and overseas uh, countries. So I consider myself as a sea goose. And, uh, and uh, certainly talking about, you know, COVID-19, that has a very significant impact in the area I'm researching on, which is international student migration. And it's also partly my work at the university. And um, already, you know, in the Australian case, as, as I said earlier, Chinese students and international students play a very important part of the Australian society, society and the universities. And uh, the growth of international students are the most important contribution to the um, net uh, uh, migra overseas migration for Australia. And the current border, you know, closure and travel ban has blocked it nearly 20% of the, you know, our uh, international students from entering Australia. And as you probably can, can hear, you know, in Victoria, we are currently under stage four lockdown. So the situation is uh, quite uh, challenging. And uh, this has very important impact for our universities and also for our students, as well as for other sectors. Um, the, this is also a period which calls for a lot of migration policy um, flexibility and innovation. And one area we have seen is also is, is on the post-study work uh, rights. Um, research done by you know, our universities and other universities have shown that, you know, that the right to work after study you know, is a very important uh, consideration for international students when they decide to study abroad. And our researcher, Professor Lei Chuan at Deakin University, interviewed um, between 2007 and 2018 uh, nearly 1,200 visa holders in Australia on their uh, motivation for study. 82% of the Indian students interviewed who said, you know, post study work is the driving factor behind their decision to study in Australia. And obviously, you know, now they can, many students can travel to Australia or to many other destination countries like Canada and the UK. So what kind of changes, you know, migration uh, visa scheme should, uh, should be? And we have seen the UK has already um, introduced flexibility for uh, eligibility for post-study um, work rights, if they, even if the students have studied online in the current academic year. And the same with Canada. So Canada also announced a very flexible uh, approach to post-graduation work permits. Uh, for international studying online. So as you know, you know, at your university, I'm sure Martin Carlton, uh, many of your international students cannot travel. So we're offering the opportunity to study online and also the, the possibility to study in onshore once the border is open. Compared to Canada and UK, Australia border is still closed. So that's more uh, challenging, but uh, we have introduced a new um, a visa scheme, which uh, last month, which again, you know, counting the time when international studies uh, offshore uh, towards the eligibility for the work experience in Australia. And uh, also there are some innovative uh, pilot projects uh, in certain states in Australia, for instance, Australian Capital Territory and the South Australia and Northern Territory. 
for a safe corridor for international students to come on shore. I, I think you know, another impact for this uh, COVID-19 is what I'm concerned is in the future for the potential brain drain for specialized sectors, professions, um, particularly in the health and medical area. Already a very you know, long standing discussion uh, and a research topic for international migration. And particularly, we see as part of the COVID 19, some countries have already and called for um, specialized uh, medical professions uh, seeking jobs abroad. For instance, the US announced um, in, in late March a call for medical professions to apply for a US visa. And nearly 9,000 Egyptian doctors were accepted in this scheme to, to come to the US, according to Arab News Network. Similarly, in many Western European countries like, uh, like Germany and France and also Canada, uh, they have also specifically you know, targeted medical professions. And I see that a major challenge, uh, particularly for uh, a continent which is Africa, uh, which has nearly 24% of the global burden of disease, but only 3% of the global health workers and 1% of the financial resources in the world, according to the Global Health Observatory. So I think this is really an important issue that we need to ensure there's um, not a brain drain for uh, especially the least developing countries in terms of medical professions. The African Union has a migration policy framework 2018 to 20. Uh, 27, which tackles some of the issues in the medical professions, but we need an uh, innovative brain circulation mechanism, for instance, leveraging, like you said, Martin, the diaspora network, uh, corp education corporations, so that's where, you know, universities like ours, you know, can contribute to, and some even call a global housekeeping force to make it more effective and long-term strategy to ensure that medical professions and medical services are available no matter where they are. So I will stop here, Martin. Great, thank you so much. And I think this links are really back to uh, what Dr. Wang Wing and this also this interesting project of uh, global talent organization or some kind of more uh, targeted discussions because rightly said, uh, you, you mentioned uh, actually the issue of perhaps brain drain or, or care drain, uh, that is, uh, might be a negative effect if it's not managed well and the health professionals, so they are one sector. But um, of course, we have also to think about uh, the talent attraction or retention becomes now even perhaps more fierce and actually this uh, war over talent that we were discussing, some uh, many scholars over the last few years it might be really uh, working differently and perhaps might become even more fierce. So I think an initiative to bring together sector partners from civil society, business community, policy community, international organization, the scholarly community, I think it's very important here to, to uh, use that moment. Um, and COVID-19, I think it's really a watershed moment. And um, right now, uh, CCG and uh, my research team, we are leading together a project that actually looks at industry technology clusters around the world and how they are doing with COVID-19 and actually how the business partners try to, to keep connected to talent because right now, the issue we are seeing, they are disconnected. And um, way it was really great that you told um, us about the flexibility some countries are offering with online studies. In Canadian case, you can actually count two years to resident residence requirement later on if you start now getting enrolled and, and, and study online. And um, there are employers that already start developing online tools to already do onboarding of future talent of actually connecting already to international students, right? And this specific example, the talent competition is ongoing, it is continuing, right? And I think it's very important for many countries in the world uh, how they situate themselves and actually as an international community and in thinking about the UN Global Compact on Migration guidelines or orientations it gave, I think it's very important to not miss that moment right now to actually make sure that migration governance stays balanced and it's actually not a, a changer that even is going to the worst, right? An unbalanced, disorderly uh, um, migration system. Um, 
what was very often mentioned on the side and it's very closely connected to brain circulation is the issue of remittances. And I want to bring back Dr. McAuliffe here to share a bit some of her insights uh, and how COVID-19 might be impacting remittances, but also what role remittances play during the pandemic and post-pandemic. Thank you much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Martin. I'm just bringing up, and this is the, the wonderful things about doing webinars, um, which has you know, very much changed all of our lives. Uh, those especially who work in uh, research, being able to connect globally. But this is a presentation that we did, we're invited to do by the World Economic Forum, their strategic intelligence platform in June and on COVID-19. And one of the kind of key issues is the remittances, international remittances that we've been talking about uh, in terms of the de projected decline, but also that they can be a real buffer for frontline response, socioeconomic recovery uh, going forward in regards to COVID-19. And one of the key things, which is depicted in this really very good World Bank graph on the top left-hand corner, is why remittances are so important uh, globally. We can see that over time, there has been a very significant shift and growth in international remittances, which is the red line there, uh, far outstripping now official development assistance, the dotted uh, black line beneath it. And also we're seeing changes in foreign direct investment occurring uh, too. We uh, spoke recently at a webinar in regards to Africa and COVID-19 uh, issues. And we can see in Africa, for example, foreign direct investment has dropped very significantly since uh, 2013 onwards. And remittances are now far outstripping uh, foreign direct investment uh, on the, this is the entire uh, continent. So, and that's a very significant shift. We know then that even with the projected fall for 2020, which is globally predicted by the World Bank to be 20%, uh, we are seeing some kind of anomalies in, in some respects, on the one hand sort of economically, but also in terms of you know, frontline response. We're seeing Mexico, for example, experience a real spike in international remittance inflows with uh, family members sending back uh, money from overseas. They might have a small amount of savings and of course they are wanting to make sure that they are providing support to this uh, pandemic shock. It's also occurring in other countries, uh, the Philippines, for example, Guatemala, and there is research showing in regards to previous pandemics, which were more localised, that the same phenomena kind of exists. The challenge now is the medium and long term. How do we support remittance flows as part of key response uh, and recovery to COVID-19? Because the projections, I think, are I'm not saying they're inaccurate. I think over, over time, they're likely to be proved accurate. But our challenge as an international community, civil society partners, the private sector and so forth is to make sure that we can really open up and utilise uh, international remittances as a, as a frontline uh, kind of response. In regards to talent uh, mobility, I just want to very briefly, if you will indulge me for one moment, share um, something that might be of interest in regards to talent mobility and relates to a project that we have been working on for some time with the World Economic Forum. And that is in relation to um, uh, the migration transformation map. Uh, that some people might be aware of. It has been translated uh, into Chinese and uh, I had the great pleasure of presenting the uh, migration transformation map at an event in uh, Tianjin uh, after it was translated into Chinese recently with the World Economic Forum. And one of the key things that the forum has been very keen to stress is that yes, we need to be looking at inequality and uneven development, uh, securitization, conflict and security challenges and displacement, as well as the demographic issues, but talent patterns is really central. 
to uh, global prosperity and to making sure that we are utilising and providing opportunities for up and coming students as uh, Professor Shen mentioned and also as Dr Wang certainly mentioned in regards to the Paris Peace Forum. So here, if you can see this, hopefully you can, there are a number of languages that are available and we're really pleased to be working with the World Economic Forum to make sure that we have this, uh, what I would call a balanced accounts of migration. Uh, it does need to include uh, talent patterns and talent mobility, international students, but of course, high skilled workers who are really central to contributing to societies all, all around the world. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I think it's really important also what was mentioned on the, on the subject slide, one key aspect, and we had printed that also on the program as one discussion points. And I want to use actually that one to bring back our panelists. So I think it's really important how we communicate also as scholars and experts on migration. And um, there has been a lot of tension recently surrounding and uncertainties and fake facts and, and so on and, and not to say and actually the World Migration Report uh, devotes quite some attention to actually get the facts right and I think the importance of language uh, is, is really important and teaching uh, about migration issues. So I would like to bring back uh, Professor Lu and Professor Sang to tell us a bit like in their work and in their daily work also encounter with students in China. How do you actually talk about migration? How is, how, why is it so important and how actually can you train uh, students on these issues? Yeah, thank you. Perhaps Professor Lu, if you don't mind, get started. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sorry, uh, me? Yeah. yeah. Oh, uh, okay. So uh, talking about students, uh, how we train about students, uh, it's like uh, um, there are lots of things about the international migration, especially uh, uh, I actually taught some classes. I don't have a, a full course on international migration, which I actually hope for. Um, but at the same time, I find it's interesting to uh, explain to Chinese students about what international migration is. It's really, uh, it's, it's quite a, a really a brand new uh, area for them. Because in China, when we talk about migration, lots of times we talk about internal migration. Uh, we talk about the migrant workers. When we talk about migrant workers, they're not uh, international mi migrant workers. They're uh, more uh, peasant workers and working, moving from rural areas to uh, urban to cities. So when you then you start talking about the, uh, you can share with them the similarities, like especially before the hukou system was uh, uh, kind of a, a really uh, opened up and uh, uh, relaxed uh, um, a couple of years ago. Um, the hukou system is kind of uh, share some similarities with the immigration policies and visa policies. Uh, in the way, because uh, when we talk about migrants, it's very important to talk about the migration status. So what kind of status you have in this country, in this host country, uh, it's kind of a remind them about uh, what kind of status uh, those migrant workers from rural area getting into the city, because those uh, status uh, determines who can stay, who uh, has to be, uh, and also what kind of a public supports a welfare services and that they can uh, we can receive in this uh, this society in the this host communities so um, I think that's very interesting mm -hmm. uh, to share that uh, to have that similarities especially yeah. before hukou system was uh, relaxed thank you very much and I think also a lot of uh, Chinese families who know very well about uh, experience of actually being abroad coming back having family members uh, migrating to, to other cities, coming back uh, to other countries, studies, coming back, and so on. And I think it's it's very important that this is actually a very important facet of globalization and also China's opening up process. And I want to bring in Professor Sang now from Jinan University to also share his thoughts about that. Uh, okay, yeah, thank you. Uh, uh, yeah. 
actually we are offering some courses to the students you know uh, but basically as i said you know, we have more courses about the uh, you know chinese overseas studies but now we are introducing some some courses like generally and and uh, you know just uh, in, uh, international and the migration uh, yeah i think this is kind of two uh, it's a new phenomena uh, like the chi you know china to being uh, traditionally you know is a country actually in the past several uh, you know, several hundred years, and especially in the past, you know, 200 years, and China was a big country of the sending, uh, you know, just sending migration uh, and the sending country, you know, like uh, this, uh, you know, report to show that China is still the number, number three, right? Uh, but uh, yeah, th that's why, uh, you know, the tradition, like I said, you know, the community, uh, we have an independent community of the overseas Chinese studies. But the new phenomenon is like, you know, in the past 40 years, uh, with the China's just opening up and more and more, you know, international in, you know, interaction with the China and, um, you know, and the whole, uh, the international community. And more and more uh, Chinese, they are still going out, but more and more, you know, uh, the, the foreigners, uh, students and traders, uh, you know, skilled workers, they're coming to China. You know, like uh, just Dr. Wang just said, you know, in China, uh, in terms of government, right, uh, you know, the Chinese government like to pay more and more attention to this kind of new phenomenon. China, China joined, you know, IOM uh, in 2016 <laughs> and two years later, actually, and the Chinese, uh, you know, government, we, we have a new agency called the you know, National Immigration and Administration, so, and, and the public security. And, and, and ministry. So, uh, and in terms of the students, actually, right, and uh, we are training the students, you know, in the terms, in the discipline of uh, international politics, but we are introducing more and more, you know, let the students study the politics um, much more from the bottom line, you know, from the, the people's flow. So this is are becoming more and more important. And uh, happy to see uh, more and more young people, they are getting more and more interest, you know, to study this uh, topic. Martin, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I think also, again, from a Canadian perspective, I think it's very important to think about also as a country receiving increasing international students, it is very much about the regulation and keeping actually this, this uh, as an orderly system and actually having pathways, but also avoiding, uh, you know, issues or management and, and regulation uh, so in Canada we have we have emerging discussions like whether uh, domestic students are like at you know a less privileged now than international students and I certainly I think you want to avoid these issues right so it's very important about communication and also having a proper regulation in place uh, that accompanies these processes, right? That uh, this, this stays also controlled and, uh, and regulated. And I think uh, China has uh, done, you know, an, an impressive policy development in, in this aspect, also allowing actually for uh, students to work in China, to gain work experience and actually thinking more and more actively retention, but then also about the proper integration, uh, I think, in, in society, which is important to do. And I think China can actually indeed share a lot uh, and not only learn from other countries, but can share a lot of expertise already in this area. I would like to bring in uh, Dr. Tsang now because you have been um, abroad uh, in Georgetown University. You worked with Susan Martin and perhaps, and you have been returned. You took on a, 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 a lectureship now at the university. Please share us briefly uh, in a way for why it's for you important actually to teach us the research migration uh, in China. Yeah, please. Okay, thanks Martin. And uh, yes, I think it's really important in teaching and uh, studying migration uh, in China because like Professor Zhang said, and uh, um, previously we are in in China's migration studies, and we also use the overseas Chinese rather than the international migration. But uh, with the globalization and the China's experts and China's uh, professors, um, 
need, uh, need to be more and more international and we need to um, open a di more dialogues with the international experts. So we need to put the terms of the overseas Chinese into the field of the international migration. And we also need to institutionalize the China's migration studies. For example, um, how do you say, build more and more institutions and build more and more social organizations or the non-government organizations like CCG and to push the uh, in, uh, international migration studies in China. And uh, that's, that is the first aspect. And the second aspect um, to study the migration studies, that is um, international migration become more and more important um, in the world politics. And uh, it is a very complicated and uh, diverse issue. It, it is not it's also about the labor migration. And uh, during the COVID-19, because my uh, PhD thesis is about the protection of labor migration, so I pay more attention to it. And uh, I found that during the COVID-19 uh, COVID and uh, a lot of labor migrations get unemployed and they cannot afford themselves. And in Singapore and in Israel, hundreds of hundreds of um, Chinese migrant workers get inflected, but their voice are uh, igno ignored to some extent. And uh, actually, um, this pandemic makes them more vulnerable than ever before. And not only about them, and also about the IT IDPs and the refugees, and they get more and more vulnerable during the during this pandemic year. So um, as a scholar and as an expert, all the um, workers and experts, and we need to pay more attention to this vulnerable group. And that is the second aspect. So uh, I think it's really important for studying international migration in China. Yeah. Um, bringing it actually to the topic of governance, and I think well, uh, uh, organized forms of, of, of governance. Um, uh, recent time we, we saw a lot of uh, questions also coming into our webinar actually about student mobility to US and the you know uh, current relations state of affairs in global relations and so on and I think Professor Sung and Professor Shen perhaps you can share some insights here. Let's, let's perhaps start with Professor Sung um, you, you asked me to speak also about this topic and um, COVID-19 and uh, what's going on right now also in global relations and how important that is in global discussions. Please. Uh, yeah, okay, Mark. Yeah, yeah all right. Uh, as I mentioned, you know, uh, on one hand, I'm trying to internationalize the community of, uh, you know, overseas Chinese studies community, you know, like, the Chi a lot of scholar, Chinese scholars, they're doing the Chinese, uh, you know, overseas studies much more from comparative international perspective. And on the other hand, you know, uh, generally I found, and if you take Chinese, you know, China, how to manage or how to, uh, you know, uh, governance the, uh, the, the, the Chinese diaspora, I found actually we have a long, uh, much long history, you know, more than 100 years ago. And uh, you know, uh, in China, actually, we have a, a central government uh, departmental level you know, department, the agency. They, uh, they, they, they're trying to manage how to serve uh, the overseas Chinese, right? And of course, at that time, international, the whole situation is very different, you know, especially a lot of Chinese diaspora in Southeast Asia, you know, they, they do not have the citizenship problem. They, you know, they do not have a very clear idea of nationality, but now it's different. But anyway, from that 100 years ago, and Chinese government, had, they have a very special way and policy to do this diaspora, you know, management. And if you put it very, but that's a very, you know, long story, but put it very simply, you can see that we have, a, you can see that their rationale, you know, also is changing. And if you take the example, you know, uh, previously I found, you know, the, the, the government policy, they very emphasize on uh, how to encourage the Chinese diaspora to contribute, you know, uh, China's uh, state building, nation building, right? 
But now we found their open slogan policy is that how do we serve this Chinese diaspora? We encourage you not necessarily to contribute everything, you know, remittance to back to China. We encourage them if you, as long as you can live well, right? If you come to the other countries, you know, if you, if as long as you can live peacefully, you can live live well. You know, that is our policy. That's our our intention. We will help you. You know, doing a lot of everything, trying to let the people to live peacefully and happily everywhere. So this is a very important, uh, you know, rational change. So and yeah, that's why it says you know, uh, I cannot see that China's case, uh, you know, is very special or unique. I think every country have its own diaspora experience and policy, but at least uh, you know from China's case. Uh, this uh, you know past 100 years i i like to see that you know this will provide some uh, you know some suggestions maybe some highlight highlights to the global uh, as we can see the global you know migration governance and china's case mm -hmm. i i think you know we can learn uh, you know from uh, from each other uh, thank you martin thank you so much on this point, I would like to bring back very briefly also Dr. Wang. Uh, and we have been talking a bit about the HGTO idea, but also as a, as a leading think tank in China, I think you can really talk about governance and global governance and China's role as well in this process. Please, Henry. Uh, thank, thank you. Thank you, Martin. And, and uh, thanks for all the great uh, views and uh, Mary and other I just shared. I, I hope that uh, uh, Mr. Crescity will, will give a final <laughs> Concluding remarks, but uh, 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 what I what I, I think is a fascinating topic because uh, migration actually for the last four decades since China opened up, migration has played such an important role for China to transform. You know that uh, uh, so we have China has lifted 800 million people out of poverty, and China has three million migrants. Uh, you know, walk around China every year, and China has already returned half, uh, you know five million uh, returned students. Uh, contributing to this great, uh, great, uh, great uh, return migration, but also uh, uh, China has uh, always has uh, uh, you know three million Taiwanese working in China. <clears throat> There's uh, probably one, uh, also one million uh, Hong Kongese working in China. There's a huge uh, domestic uh, uh, and international migration. China has uh, you know historically altogether has a sixty million diaspora overseas, probably the largest diaspora group in the world. And uh, since China opened up. There's over 10 million Chinese has, from mainland has, has migrated to the different parts of the world. Uh, there's, uh, there's, uh, there's more than 5 million uh, Chinese uh, in the United States, uh, 2 million in Canada, another 1 million in Australia, probably another uh, you know, 2 million, you know, huge uh, uh, talent network. So I think that those needs to be further studied and researched. I agree with uh, uh, Professor Zhang that uh, this, uh, this kind of overseas Chinese probably should be uh, get into this migration group, uh, as also uh, uh, Yali just mentioned as well. So I think there, there's a broad prospect just opened up. So I think this is fascinating. Uh, we are discussing uh, with uh, uh, IOM, you know, which is the authority, uh, leading authority on migration in China, as also Mary just mentioned about talent uh, study as well. So, so I think that we, we, we want to continue this collaboration. I think uh, uh, Martin just mentioned it's great. I mean, we need to have this uh, uh, alliance of global talent organization. We're going to have a, uh, another meeting at the Paris Peace Forum uh, this November. We will welcome you all to attend. And uh, also, uh, I'm, I'm very pleased to report that uh, our webinar this afternoon has got wide right attention. We have uh, over 240,000 uh, uh, on our channel, uh, Chinese language uh, uh, portal. We have a simultaneous translation going on. And then we have another 84,000 English viewers uh, on that. And our staff overseas is broadcast this live on the face and tweet and also uh, uh, YouTube. So, so I think, you know, there's a really uh, uh, one of the, you know, probably first of this kind of a, a war migration report uh, combined with Chinese uh, reality ever produced in China. So, so I think this is really fascinating. I want to thank all of you for, for this great support. So unfortunately, I'm having another video conference. <laughs> I'm already late. So I, I would not like uh, Martin to continue. And I want to thank uh, Mary and uh, uh, Chris City and all the other distinguished panels very much. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Henry. 
and uh, good luck with the next webinar. Uh, thanks for having you, and uh, it's an honor. Yeah. Appreciate it. Okay, thank you. So I, I uh, interrupt briefly, and I want to bring uh, still uh, Professor Wen uh, in, um, and uh, we have been discussing. Uh, yeah, global governance, and you have you have been in Europe. You are you are now in the U Australia, and uh, you have studied also a lot of the, the policies uh, related to student mobility. And what do you think comes out of this pandemic? Uh, do we see now like a changing of you know policies on on student mobility? And perhaps if you can talk also more generally about migration in different countries. Thank you very Please. much. And Martin, so first of all, I want to maybe continue the discussion diasporas. I think diaspora is very important uh, in the COVID world and post-COVID world. And particularly, you know, in my own experience, you know, having been a Chinese diaspora abroad, I see really the, they, they play a very important role in the COVID uh, relief, but also in the uh, bilateral relations. And for instance, you know, there, there's a kind of saying on the internet circulating, Chinese internet, you say, China played the first half of a football, a COVID football match against COVID, and the rest of the world played the second half of the match, and the Chinese living abroad played the whole match. You know, because they are, you know, at the beginning of the outbreak, you know, many Chinese cities, uh, Chinese living abroad, you know, sent face marks, including myself, you know, to, to China. And the second half, we became the recipients, you know, from, you know, from our Chinese friends and, and colleagues. And even at the university level, you know, we, was, we were sending, you know, um, some PPE to, to China, but uh, unfortunately, due to the restrictions, we couldn't send it. Then the, the next day, we, we, we received requests from our Chinese university saying, can they send some to us? So I think this uh, global solidarity, that's really important, and particularly, during COVID time, you know, there's a lot of uncertainties and, and uh, uh, among, you know, migrant communities and also perception of migrants and you, this kind of people-to-people -people exchange through the diaspora communities is very important. One of the video I really liked uh, is a Chinese student living, studying in Italy, and he did the video, basically went on the street and put with the poster to say, you know, I'm a human, I'm not a virus. And that was very touching, you know, then, then you see ordinary people in Italy accepted this student, not because, you know, not because his skin color or his nationality, but just accept as a human. I think that's the message. At the end, we're all humans, whether, you know, we're migrants, we are, uh, or not. And the second thing I really want to say is, um, as you said, on the long-term impact on, on student migration in the area I'm working on, and I think that has fundamental change to look at, you know, the current situation with U.S., for instance, there are a number of reasons, you know, uh, why, you know, Chinese students may, may not study in U.S. or, or study less in, in the U.S. due to the visa restriction, the, um, the, the, the a pandemic situation in the U.S., but also I see, you know, it's, it's growing opportunities in China and also the opportunity for online education as well as transnational education. So that's a really phenomenon we are seeing that, you know, um, that kind of traditional uh, going, you know, study abroad may, may, may have you know, fundamental changes to have a more hybrid model where students can study partly offline or online, offshore, partly online, onshore, or part online, onshore, yeah, or a combination. And there are a number of reasons the cost is an issue and the safety is another issue. The politics, the international relations, bilateral relations is also an issue. And um, we are also, you know, encountered with, you know, this in certain areas like technology areas, sensitive areas where there's a even greater restriction um, on, on the kind of the mobility of, you know, scholars and, and scientists. So uh, I think the COVID is a really an important uh, Kind of um, dividing, you know, moment, you know, for for many things, and uh, even companies, uh, some you know, large companies have already authorized, you know, permanent working from home arrangement after COVID yes. tonight. So, what kind of impact will be for skilled migration? Do you have to, uh, you know, migrate or, or you know, be expatriated to work for a company abroad? You know, and what are the future governance on this transnational, virtual transnational migration and and the migratory work will be very important? Yeah. Thank I you. think this is very important what you say about also new modes of employment and new structures of employment and remote work, the pooling also of, of talents by companies, right, to share talent, actually, remote talent. And I think um, a lot of things were already, let's say, in the process, in the go, the introduction of artificial intelligence, of platforms like Zoom right now that we are using, 
right? And I think it's changing uh, labor migration quite significantly now. And and COVID nineteen is is basically the accelerant uh, of it, right? And I think to to say one very important uh, remark here is I think it's very important how we gonna actually look at regulation and also avoid actually talents become immersed in a global gig economy where they are totally in limbo and uh, just freelancing for for talent uh, for for companies worldwide and uh, it opening up actually to to un, uh, you know exploitation or uh, very low standards of, of employment and so on i think so the the regulation both nationally and globally uh, are becoming very important so i would like to uh, very quickly have a look at some of the questions I have received and I seem, say, think some of them have been already addressed but one question that came in for media was simply I think I'd like to invite everyone one let's say give like a 30 second short <laughs> opinion someone was asking how will migration look like in the future just very briefly, what you say. So, Wei, you, you already said a few things. <laughs> we don't start with you, so perhaps someone else. Who wants to jump in? Perhaps Yadi, yeah. <laughs> okay, um, in the short term, I think COVID-19 COVID impedes global mobility and makes migration more vulnerable. But in the long run, global migration and uh, uh, global mobility this is the trend for the future i think we, we can't we cannot stop it and uh, but on the other hand we need uh, um, we need more than in denver to global migration governance so that is the prospect for the uh, global mobility or global migration in my view mm -hmm. thank you so hey uh martin uh i'm different yeah i think from the the very short short term and uh, um, you know, very pessimistic because of the you know COVID nineteen and everything stopped. And even from a long term, and uh, not only because the COVID nineteen, but but partly because of, because of nineteen, but also because of the rising, uh, you know, agreed power politics, the rising you know uh, populism, nationalism, and all this kind of thing is going to be a very bad influence on the migration and uh, if from a much much longer time you know from humanity from the need of the people i think you know probably could be uh, you know optimistic thank you Professor Lu, please thank you okay uh, i think it's uh, uh, that question is very interesting because it brings up another question i actually think about and curious about is how the pandemic may influence uh, people's migration intentions and uh, also mobility patterns in the future so i i don't have i don't have i really i really don't want to give a really clear answer on that i actually um can uh, say something about uh, we did a really a small survey on chinese returnees uh in sichuan uh, this june and the three result shows that 23 percent of these returnees changed their plans for future migration due to COVID 19. uh 20 percent decided to stay in sichuan or china longer than what they intended before COVID-19 outbreak, and three wanted to leave Sichuan sooner because they want to go back to home uh, be, to be with fa their family. So I think this little survey, and uh, I think this number, the percentage will be uh, will be much higher, probably in bigger cities like Beijing, Shanghai, and they have greater population of migrants. So um, it would be interesting to find out how that really make people think about migration. Um, Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And I want to bring in uh, Dr. McAuliffe. Thank you very much, Martin. And, and I would wholeheartedly agree with all the previous uh, speakers and really highlight that there is an opportunity and it does depend on member states um, uh, for IOM and others, uh, governments around the world, uh, cities and local communities but also, and in a very uncertain and difficult geopolitical time, let's acknowledge that, but also 
to really point to what we are seeing in regards to COVID-19 response from the bottom up. So we are seeing, for example, stranded migrants in different parts of the world. Uh, it's a, certainly a core part of IOM's uh, recovery and response uh, kind of initiatives and its plan. But we are seeing civil society actors, local communities, families supporting people who have been stranded, whether that is stranded internally because of internal mobility restrictions, uh, or whether that's internationally and the support, say for example, that international students are receiving from not just not just their uh, fellow uh, members of their diaspora, but from the broader community who understand that this is a, a, a really significant uh, pandemic that requires a whole range of responses. So while I do agree with the kind of the pessimistic out, outlook in terms of the broader kind of governance and global dynamic issues, of course, uh, we can't ignore that, it would be naive to ignore that. What we can see is uh, the real positive aspects in regards to people wanting to assist those who are most vulnerable, the internally displaced, the refugees and uh, people who have become stranded all over the world, whether they are international students or they're migrant workers harvesting, you know, our kind of uh, agricultural products to deliver to uh, people in populations all around the world. And that's not just in the so-called global north, that's also occurring in various parts of the world, in India, in Thailand, uh, throughout Asia, throughout Latin America. So I see that there's a lot of opportunism um, uh, and a lot of opportunity, uh, more correctly, to, to look at the bright side and to see that there, there are kind of um, there are potentially some benefits that will come from COVID-19, but I do think it will be a long haul. And I think it will take a lot of willpower, uh, including through the Global Compact on Migration. In many ways, we are extraordinarily lucky to have a robust framework to enable international cooperation that isn't just about member states, it's also about civil society actors uh, and communities and academics, most importantly, for certainly for my uh, area of collaboration. It's very important for academics and applied researchers who work in the field to be having these discussions and to be really looking at crafting uh, interventions and policy solutions that really support both migration, but also migrants uh, in different settings. Thanks. So I think this, this brings us also to the end of our discussion today. And I think what is very important is this role that was just highlighted of uh, civil society organizations, scholarly community, think tanks like CCG, uh, hosting such important discussions together with international organizations and other entities regularly on a regularly basis, I think it's really important to, to uh, promote more a discussion on migration because it is uh, right now also this moment, uh, I hinted at it already, a watershed moment actually where a lot of discussions restart again and you have a lot of in countries like Canada in, including uh, about the value of international migration, about uh, what's the importance, right? And we are all around the world relaunching uh, at some point soon. China has already admitted back a lot of foreign experts, right? Because they are highly uh, appreciated. They are really me. And it's in a lot of other countries uh, right now. It's also at uh, the stage of opening up again. Um, and I think this is a key moment. And um, I think it was a really good, a good thing to have the UN Global Compact on Migration adopted before the pandemic, right? And I think it's now really the moment to put it in place. And I think to leave it uh, here on that note, I would like to bring in uh, Giuseppe Crusetti to, to close with me that uh, event. I would like to um, actually uh, thank all the panelists, all the speakers, uh, Dr. McAuliffe from the IOM for their participation today. And we are in a worship of several hundred thousands of people. It's amazing. Uh, it's just six o'clock in the morning in Canada. So this is amazing to wake up like that. Uh, yeah, to have just a morning. Um, so Giuseppe, please join me and perhaps you share a few remarks to close this event. Thank you, Martin. Um, just before I conclude, you asked how migration will look like post-pandemic in 30 seconds, and 
I'd like to answer that too. Echoing my colleague Mary's cautious optimism and Martin, your, your remarks on the timing of the pandemic post and not prior to the GCA. I, I tend to agree with all those who see the COVID-19 crisis as a wake-up call and as an opportunity to rethink how we do business and to develop strategies for building better. Well, government migration can indeed be a transformative pathway for achieving this. Now, back to my closing remarks, and as we have reached the end of the program, I would like to express IOM's appreciation to Dr. Wang and the World CCG for the excellent preparation and delivery of yet another successful event in their long series of webinars that week after week continue to provide us all with unique opportunities for insightful exchanges on various topics, many of which are relevant to migration and mobility issues. The World Migration Report is only one of many examples of IOM CCG long-standing collaboration. But I also wish to thank Dr. Geiger for being our moderator today, a job Dr. Geiger is not new to and that he performs with impeccable mastery and Swiss club. Dr. Geiger possesses indeed a wealth of migration knowledge and experience and a genuine interest in China's developments. If you found, as I did, today's event of interest is largely due to our distinguished panelists and speakers, whom I sincerely thank for making time to share their perspective with us today on a very important and timely issue, migration. And they showed the way on how to make the most of a publication like the World Migration Report. And then finally, a note of thanks goes to our interpreters and to the nearly 300,000 online and national and international participants who have chosen to stay with us today and connect from different parts of the world and different time zones. I believe a video recording of this webinar will also be made available later on for those who could not join us. Once again, on behalf of IOM and on behalf of Dr. Wang at CCG, we have to step out. Thank you and wish you all a very productive rest of the day. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much and everyone for joining and participating and helping with this webinar. Uh, discloses our official launch of the World Migration Report in Chinese edition and our discussion on the challenges and opportunities of global migration. Thank you so much for attending.